In Christianity, there is really nothing more important than the gospel. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And the gospel is the message of good news that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, born of a virgin, lived a perfectly righteous life, suffered and died on the cross, offering that life to pay for sins. He was buried in the ground and rose to life on the third day according to the Scriptures. And when that message is preached, the unbelieving world scoffs at it. They deride it. They call it foolishness. You tell people this message about Christ, and they laugh in your face. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, to us who are being saved, this message is the power of God to save. Those whom God calls, they hear the gospel, they confess their sins to Him, they acknowledge their lostness and their deadness, they trust in Jesus Christ, and they are saved. Today, however, this word gospel is oftentimes overused, misused, and even abused. For all of the gospel-centered, gospel-focused ministry that's being done right now in the world, we read about it online, we see all the ministries popping up, everything is gospel, gospel, gospel. For all that's being done in the name of the gospel that is good, there is, it seems, an equal amount of damage being done as well to the gospel by those who intend to pervert and distort and destroy the gospel. Just because someone comes to you and says they're bringing gospel doesn't always necessarily mean that it is. There is a real and present danger at hand the problem of false gospels. And there are varying degrees of this. There is a very distinct anti-Christian message, bold declarations that attack the person and work and message of Jesus Christ. Someone comes to you and they say, I've got the good news, I have something I want to tell you. And they very distinctly and explicitly tear down the person of Christ. And that's very obvious to your thinking. When someone comes to your door and they have tracts in literature and you ask them, what do you think about Jesus? And they tell you what they think and it's this perverted, distorted, strange teaching about Christ that nothing in scriptures bear witness to. And you can identify that and say, well, that's false. That's awful. That's very clearly an anti-gospel message. But then there are the more nuanced variations of this that affirm a large amount of truth. And you hear the message and you're like, yeah, I I believe that. And they'll tell you what they believe. You say, amen, that's right. But then some small element comes in. And that small little element then permeates and distorts the whole thing. Because Satan always will use an element of truth. He will capture an element of truth and then pervert it with a lie which doesn't take away from the truth element, but by itself, altogether, it ruins the message. Whether it's overt or covert, both instances of gospel perversion are deadly. They are staunchly deadly. And while the church is usually very keen to oppose and reject the blatant false gospel, the covert nuanced false gospel can sneak into a church like a Trojan horse. You don't even see it coming. And sometimes it takes a while to manifest itself. But when it does, it's like a cancer. But we are called to contend earnestly for the faith. All of us, not just the pastor, not just the elders. All of us are called to contend, to be diligent, Because in every generation, beloved, the church will be attacked. It always is, as Satan works very hard to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
We must know what we believe. We must know what is true in order to oppose what is false. And that is why I believe Galatians will truly help us to this end. Not just today, but in the coming weeks and months as we work through this letter. It's going to help you, I pray, to become more robust in your understanding of what the gospel is, all the parts of the gospel, how it works, how you're saved, how you're justified, even how you're sanctified, and what that looks like as well. And so turn with me to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. During Paul's first missionary journey, he traveled through the regions of Galatia, preaching the gospel, making disciples, planting churches, doing the work of ministry. He travels to cities like Pisidian Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. These are all Gentile cities. They don't have a large contingency of Jews, even though there are some. And he's going to these otherwise pagan cities, and he's preaching to them the gospel. And after he leaves, however, a group of Jewish teachers called Judaizers, they come in behind the Apostle Paul, and they're claiming to be Christians, even though they're insisting on keeping an aspect of the Mosaic Law. And they come in behind Paul, and they begin to attack his character, his apostleship, and his message. And we talked about this a little bit last week. But their contention is that Paul's gospel is incomplete. It's only part one. They are contending that the Gentile converts to Christianity need to be adhering at least on some level to the law of Moses. Because after all, they would claim the Messiah is a Jewish Messiah. The law and the prophets, the temple, the promises, everything that they know of revelation comes through Israel. And so they're saying, well, it's wrong if you don't tell them that they have to obey and adhere to at least some of this. You're telling them that they're they're believing in Christ by faith alone and that's it, there's nothing else. And they're warning that this is going to lead to antinomianism and this is going to lead to false converts. And and they're going to contend that, well, at at least teach them circumcision and and Sabbath keeping. I mean, at least least keep the Sabbath holy, right? They claim, according to Acts 15.1, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, they say you cannot be saved. That's their contention. And I believe that along with that, there's a whole other thing. It's not just the one thing. It never is. False teachers will say, well, well, just do this one thing. And the church in legalism says, well, okay, we'll we'll, we'll go to that. Well, we'll at least we'll do that. And then as soon as that comes in the door, well, but if you're going to do that, then you've got to do all these other things too. It's never just one error. There's always 50 errors on the back of the one. But it doesn't take Paul long before he hears about this, that Judaizers are in Galatia, and they're adding to his gospel. And so he writes the Galatian churches a letter. In the opening of the letter, Paul makes a brief statement about his apostleship. He's going to to spend the next two chapters defending that apostleship. But we note in verse 1, he says that he's not sent as an apostle from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Christ. See, the Judaizers believed that they could discredit Paul's apostleship, and if they could do that, they could undermine his message. So so destroy the messenger, and the message goes with it. But even Paul's message didn't come from men. It came, according to verse 12, through a revelation of Jesus Christ. But they were attacking the message. But what is the message of the gospel according to Paul? What is this message? Well, we saw last week that he gives a very brief summary message in really verse 4. It kind of bleeds into 3 and a little bit into 5, but it's this. Here's his message. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. And so that is the message he preached That's the message that they had believed. That is the message that saves. And again, this is a a smaller version. It's it's a message of the gospel in seed form, like John 3.16 or verses like that. But something has happened 
He's delivered this message. They've received it. They've believed it. They've been planting churches around this truth. And something happens between verse 5 and verse 6. Look with me. Verse 6. Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only that there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? For if I am striving to please men, if I was striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So I want to take these verses and I want to break them up into two main points here. But number one, we're going to look at the perversion of the true gospel. So perversion of the true gospel. Normally, if you've read Paul's letters, you've seen this. Normally, after his introduction, he usually offers some kind of a, of a, a word of thanksgiving. He's always thankful for the churches. Praise be to God. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your love, for your faith. He did it to the Colossians. He went on for several verses about his thankfulness, about his prayer for them. Even to the Corinthian church, even the church that was just rife with problems, he was still thankful for that church. But here, he doesn't offer any kind of a word of thanksgiving. The only thing he offers here is bewilderment. He says, as if to sort of change his tune very quickly, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. The Greek word translated amazed can also be rendered perplexed, bewildered, stupefied. When Paul hears that the congregations are are falling away from the truth, he, he can't believe it. He's just kind of in shock and in awe. I was, I was just with you. Like, what changed from here to there? He says almost the same thing, or he offers the same, the same sentiment in, uh, in chapter 3. We hear his tone, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes was Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified? Who is, what happened? Who's done something? What's changed between there and here? I'm, I'm beside myself. I don't understand. And he used this word here, deserting. You've deserted him who's called you. This word deserting can have a military usage to it. Uh, It means defecting or committing treason by going to the other side. And so the fact that this happens so quickly just boggles his mind. It's like they've turned on a dime. So you were running well over here. When When I left, things were going great. And now I hear that you've just like gone to the other side. All of you. And they're not just deserting the gospel itself, which he refers to here as the grace of Christ. He says, look at the text. They're deserting God who called them by such grace. And so by abandoning the gospel, they're abandoning the God of the gospel. So you can't just throw away God's message without also throwing him away. Paul connects the two. You see that? And as we're going to see as we move through the letter, they're effectively rejecting the grace of God. It's like wholesale. They've they've just run away from the whole thing. He says in chapter 5, verse 4, he says, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace, severed from Christ. He's seizing on this circumcision motif, if you will. He says, they're talking about you cutting off parts of the flesh. He says, look, by doing this, you've cut yourself off from Jesus Christ. You've circumcised yourself completely completely. 
He says of the false teachers, you know what? I wish that they would just, if they think circumcision is so great, just keep on going. Emasculate yourself. If you think that keeping the law is so great, it's going to justify you. I mean, Paul is white hot with rage in this letter. He gets so angry about the fact that they are cutting themselves off from the Lord completely by adopting a false gospel. In rejecting the grace of Christ, they're deserting God. He says, for a different gospel. For a different gospel. The word that's used here is heteros, some other, a different kind, foreign, strange, even illicit. A different message about how to get right with God. You found some other way? There's some other method, some other message that's going to get you to... What? I'm perplexed. I'm bewildered. Tell me about this perverted message of yours. Then he says, look, this message that you're hearing, this different gospel, he says, it's not really another. It's not really another. He uses a different word here. It's not heteros. The second usage is, is alos. And he puts a negative in front of it. So he says, it's not even another of the same kind. So it's not like I was preaching to you this gospel and then you heard just another gospel that also saves. It's not, it's not, it's not really another. There's not two ways to get to heaven. I don't care what Oprah says. There's not two ways to heaven. There's not two messages of Christ, of salvation. There's not two gospels. There's only one true, biblical, saving gospel. But they're turning to a divergent gospel. A heterodox gospel. A gospel that cannot and does not save. And then he gives the motive of the Judaizers here. And incidentally, this is the motive of every single proponent of false gospel. He says in verse 7, There are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. This word translated disturbing literally means to shake violently. That's what happens in churches when there's error and false gospel that comes in, agitating, confusing, troubling the church. This is one reason as a pastor, as a, a leader, that I feel so impassioned about this issue because the body of Christ, all of you, work so hard to maintain unity and to maintain a, a, a building up, an edification. You work together, you strive together, you bear with one another, you love each other. When you sin, you confess and you, re, and you repair the relationship. You all work so hard, and so do the leadership. All of us work so hard to build something that's going to be strong, that's going to be great. We're built up in Jesus Christ. We try to obey Ephesians chapter 4 to the best of our ability. We have elders. We're appointing deacons. We're doing ministry. We love each other. We serve each other. This is so fragile. The unity of a church is so fragile. You need to treat unity with kid gloves and be very careful when you speak, when you act, when you go on social media, when you think about saying something against a brother or a sister in Christ, when you think about bringing a charge against an elder, which Paul warns strenuously about in 1 Timothy chapter 5. But all of us work so hard. We're committed to doctrine. We're committed to, to teaching, to love, and to encouragement. And when someone comes along, either into this assembly or through the internet or wherever, when someone comes along and offers even a slightly confusing message of how to get right with God, it sows seeds of doubt, it, it confuses people, it disturbs people, it shakes up whole churches. I've heard of more churches than I'd like to admit who've been split in half over an issue of doctrine. Sometimes it's contention. Sometimes it's warring families. But there are so many times when a church is ripped apart by the issue of doctrine. And sometimes it's small elements of doctrine. But sometimes, many times, it is gospel issues. 
and it comes in, the church hears about it, and it just shakes everything right to the core. It confuses people. It disturbs them. It shakes them violently, and it causes the assembly to question their own understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very foundation by which we're saved. Do you see the problem with that? It sneaks in so carefully. It comes in under the carpet, under the cracks of the door, through the internet, through the blog post, through things that you share, through things that you say, through books that come into the church. That's why I guard the library. I know I'm kind of retentive and sort of a controlling person in that regard. But there's a reason, beloved. There's a reason I care about what you're reading. That's how, that's how it comes in. Now, I can't control what's on your shelf. And frankly, that's not my job to control that. But when you start handing out books to people and say, oh, this is a great book. And it has error, false doctrine, false gospel in it. That's how it comes in. Be very, very careful. But this can also happen in other ways, in ways in which that we're not always expecting. A prominent Christian leader, someone who's famous, they come along and they offer a correction or a variation to the gospel and it sends people into chaos. This is happening right now. This happens in every age. This is happening, though, right now with what is being called social gospel, but it's also flying under the mask of social justice gospel. There's so many false gospels. We'll get to probably dozens of them, but this, is, this has been on my mind and on my heart presently. According to Daryl Harrison, a go- this is the gospel of social liberation and empowerment, built on the premise that our purpose in life is to bring an end to all injustice and suffering. Now, this has been argued about in the political sphere for years. There's, it's always been talked about um, just over and over again. You've seen articles in the papers about it and so on and so forth. But now, this is finding its way into the church. And it's touching issues like personal identity, Ethnicity, sexuality, marriage, family, even issues of authority. It's touching a lot of points that the Bible is very clear about. That somehow the gospel includes a mandate to empower those who've been oppressed, marginalized, or even who have suffered injustice. Now that's a broad category. A lot of people have been hurt. A lot of people have been uh, suffered injustice. Lots of people groups have been hurt. In fact, one Christian leader recently issued a statement, and I just want to read a couple of things, just a a few lines of this. This is just one example that's indicative of kind of what's going on. He's a well-known leader. If I said his name to you, you would recognize him. He writes this, For all of my passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ which has been accurate and faithful to the best of my ability, the gospel that I have held so dear has been, in reality, a truncated and incomplete gospel. He continues, I have invested my life in ministry in teaching, preaching, and writing about the gospel. But then he contends later on, I have become deeply persuaded that we, talking about the church at large, we cannot celebrate the gospel of God's grace without being committed, a committed ambassador of the gospel of his justice as well. And when he's using that phrase or the term justice, he's referring to this, a focus on social justice and social issues. Now, I want to be clear about this. Are we to take care of other people? Yes, we are. Are we to help other people? Yes, we are. We win people to the gospel of Christ by our deeds. There, there's a, there's a, a visible witness. Are we to weep with those who weep and bear with those who are hurting? Yes, we are. 
If there is someone who comes into our number who has been hurt or has suffered injustice or who's been marginalized or who's been beaten down and they come to us and they're wounded, we are to bear with one another. We are to bear their burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That is biblical if they've been hurt. If we have committed sin personally, if we've committed a sin against another person and hurt them, we are to repent. But the message of Christ, the message of the gospel, is about what he has done to rescue and redeem. The gospel is about Jesus and what he has done to bring us to God. The gospel has never been about social revolution. It's not. Once we're regenerated and reconciled to God, yes, we are also reconciled to other people. So we're reconciled to anyone else. Anyone who has suffered injustice, and this is happening right now, and I I hate to use the word because I think it's biblically wrong, the race issue, it's it's really an ethnicity issue. There's one race, the human race. You read the Bible, it's very clear. There's not different races of human beings. There's one race, and we look different than each other. But we are reconciled to one another. When a person of a different ethnicity, when they come to faith in Jesus Christ, they are now my brother and sister. Because of our commonality, our common regeneration and faith in Jesus Christ. That's what reconciles. We are not to take our cues from culture. We are to take our cues from Christ. The gospel is not Jesus plus empowerment. It's not Jesus plus liberation or Jesus plus social action. Just likewise here, it is not Jesus plus circumcision or Jesus plus law keeping or Jesus plus good deeds or Jesus plus moralism or experience or prosperity or whatever you want to tack onto the gospel. We are justified by faith in Christ apart from works of the law. Now, According to Galatians 5 and 6, once we are justified, once we are saved, then there is fruit that is born out of our lives. The fruit of godliness, the fruit of sanctification, whereby we desire to love other people and contend for them. Yes. But to make this other element contingent on the gospel, or vice versa, I should say, make the gospel contingent of this, to say that you're not truly a Christian if you don't X, Y, Z. That is another gospel. Anytime you add anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are preaching a different gospel. And I am amazed that there are so many popular Christian teachers right now that are running to embrace this. Pastors who have been faithful for decades are now suddenly turning on a dime and saying we have to go and do this and bring this into the gospel. And they have large followings. And they speak at big conferences. And they've written lots of books. But anytime you're adding anything to the gospel, you're preaching a different gospel. We have to see this. And there's going to be an element of guilt and shame. You're going to feel it. What do you mean you don't embrace this element? Are you hateful? Are you spiteful? You must be sinning. We have to contend earnestly and know what is the true gospel. What is this message of Christ? Now, Paul doesn't take his foot off the gas here. He doesn't. He doesn't stop. Number two, number two, punishment for false gospels. Punishment for false gospels. Look at verses eight and nine. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. If there's any question as to the seriousness of preaching a divergent gospel, it's answered here. 
Notice in verse 8, I want you to pay attention to this, that Paul is including himself in the warning. He says, even if we, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Titus, James, Peter, John, even if we do it, this applies. Nate, even if I do this, preach to you a gospel that is contrary to what we've been preaching, what, according to what the scriptures have said, even if I preach to you a gospel that does not gel, this applies to me. But Paul says, even if we, and then he adds, or an angel from heaven. Now, some scholars have said that there's an element of, of maybe Jewish mysticism that they were claiming to receive revelations from angels and that's authoritative and so on. I can't find that in the text, so I'm not convinced to go that direction, but I personally believe that this is hyperbole. Even though we know from history that there has been cases where people, false prophets like Muhammad or Joseph Smith, claim to have been visited by an angel from heaven, and that has launched into a whole religion of false doctrine. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians 11, 14. But I think Paul is going a little bit farther. I think he's doing something different. In the context here, he's dealing with men who reportedly came from Jerusalem and they're claiming to be sent by the apostle James. James, you know, the half-brother of Jesus, he sent us to you. Chapter 2, verse 6, he claims that these men were of high reputation. They were prominent Jewish leaders. They had strong reputations. They had advanced theological degrees. They knew, at least as far as we were concerned, the Old Testament, certainly the Torah, all these men had memorized the entire Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. They knew chapter and verse by heart. And if you were to pose them, they would quote you scripture all day long. They would argue exegetically. They had large followings. These men were prominent. But Paul says, what they were makes no difference to me because God shows no partiality. I don't care who it is, he says. Apostles, prophets, even angels. Famous pastors, Christian leaders, large followings. It makes no difference. Nobody is authorized to preach a false gospel, a divergent gospel, a nuanced, truncated, something else gospel. After all, even when Peter became tempted to adhere to this gospel, the Bible says Paul opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Paul saw this in Peter, his fellow apostle, and he went to them and he says, brother, you're in sin, you're wrong. When Paul and Barnabas and Titus, when they go to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, they go to the Jerusalem council, he says, false brethren, he's talking about the Judaizers, false brethren sneaked in in order to bring us into bondage. And that is always what false religion does. False gospel wants to grab you and bring you into bondage, into slavery. That's what a false message of Christ tries to do. But Paul countered and he declared this, We did not yield in subjection for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. He didn't care about their popularity or their prominence. God doesn't care about that. God doesn't care about how many followers you have, how many books you've written, how big you are, how big your platform is, your brand, whatever you are. He does not care about your status in this world if you are preaching against him and causing his church to reject the gospel and the God of the gospel. Paul maintained, if anyone should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And just in case anybody think he's misspeaking here, he repeats the sentiment in verse 9. Now this word accursed is the word anathema. It means dedicated to destruction. So it's more than just a pronouncement. It involves suffering the wrath of God. 
Puritan William Perkins has noted, God has given to the church the power of binding, and it has four degrees. Admonition, suspension of the sacraments, excommunication, anathema. And he says, and the last is a censure or judgment of the church whereby it pronounces a man severed from Christ and sentenced to eternal perdition. So anathema isn't just kicking somebody out of the church. It's a pronouncement that they are actually headed for God's judgment. That they are cut off from Christ. But there's always a temptation to alter the message to fit the audience. Always. If I think that you wanted to hear a different message, there's always a little element in me that's fleshly that says, you know, just give the people what they want. They don't want to hear this. They don't want, to, they don't want that. That's a, that's, that's a tough message to hear. That, that's divisive. That's too hard. You know what? I'm just going to I'm going to soften it. I'm just going to ignore certain elements of that. I'm going to downplay that. Paul warns Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that there are there's a time coming when people will not endure sound doctrine. And they won't endure the offense of the gospel. We're in those days. You can't talk about hell. You can't talk about repentance. You can't talk about the judgment of God and the condemnation of the sinner. You can't even say sinner. Unless it's in a joke. Oh, I'm such a sinner. Ha, ha, ha. No. Apart from Christ, you're destined for hell. Where Jesus says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I don't want to hear that. I don't care. But they always want to hear that. And he says here, Paul, I'm continuing in 2 Timothy, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers and according to their, their own desires. They don't want to hear sound doctrine. I want to hear the guy that makes me feel good. I've heard that contention. I've heard of people going to their pastor and saying, I don't like your messages. They make me feel too bad. I talked to a pastor last week. He says, I got a guy in my church who came to me and doesn't like the fact that he goes away feeling sad every week. Now, this guy's preaching the gospel. If you're sad, maybe there's a problem. Maybe you haven't repented and trusted in Jesus Christ. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have not been born again, I hope you're miserable. Until you repent and trust him. Because this little sadness you feel in this life is far better than what you would experience apart from the the grace and mercy of God. And so I would implore unbelievers, those who don't know Jesus, to trust Him. To repent and turn from your sin. Paul continues, they will turn away their ears from the truth and they will turn aside to myths. That's what they do when they reject the gospel. They're turning to myths. And whatever is popular in culture, whatever, every five to ten years, it's something new. And actually, this is something old. J. Gresham Machen contended for this very same issue in the 1920s and 30s. This social gospel was really popular back then, to the point where it was throwing the church back on its heels. And he wrote this book called Christianity and Liberalism. Incredible book. I would commend it to you. J. Gresham Machen, Christianity and Liberalism. And you could read it. It reads like today's newspaper. It was written 90 years ago. But it's the same thing. Coming back around. It always does. What's crazy is those who are seeking the praise of men by preaching false doctrine will always accuse gospel ministers of the very same thing. They turn the tables. They say, well, you're just trying to please man. You don't really care about the needs of people. You don't really care about what's going on in the world. You don't really care about the church. You're selfish. You need to repent that somehow you're pleasing man by preaching the gospel. And that's what they're accusing Paul of here. Look at verse 10. He answers. He says, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? He says, or am I striving to please men? Is that what you're accusing me of? He says, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant, a doulos, a slave of Jesus Christ. 
It's funny that they would accuse him of man-pleasing when he's pronouncing anathemas on people. That somehow that pleases people? It's really a strange contention. But the mind of the false is perverted. Rather, Paul is rejecting the the praise of man. Rather, he's laboring for the approval of one. He wants to please the master. True ministers of the gospel don't care about what people say about them. They want to please the master. They must. There is a mandate. There is a charge. There is a stewardship attached to preaching and ministering the gospel. There is a charge attached to your ministry to preach the gospel. It doesn't matter what people think of you. By the way, they're going to hate you. Just accept that fact right now. But to those who are being saved, they will love you. They will love you. So-and-so preached the gospel to me. I will love them forever. He starts by defending his apostleship in verse 1. But by verse 10, he's proclaiming himself to be a slave. I'm a slave of Christ. He didn't preach the gospel because it made him popular. Actually, he admits in verse chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Look, I'm bearing on my body the brand marks of Jesus. You think I'm in this for popularity? I was stoned and left for dead. You think I'm in this for money? You think I'm in this for prominence? He says, I'm elsewhere in Colossians. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. They're trying to kill me because I'm being faithful to preach the gospel to you. I don't care about what other people say. I care about what God says. He himself was hated and persecuted. In fact, according to Acts chapter 14, verse 19, Paul is traveling in the Galatian city of Lystra, and that's where the Judaizers stoned him. So the very same people who are coming in behind him preaching a false gospel, those very people might have been the exact same people who tried to kill him. How does he get his revenge? Does he go after them? in the flesh and try to get his vindication? Nope. I'll be vindicated by the courts of heaven. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to preach the gospel to the people of God. And by the way, because I know you're preaching a false gospel, you get nothing but anathema. You get nothing but curse. Not from me. From God. Paul was a bondservant of Christ, not a man pleaser, and he was determined to stand for the truth of the gospel. Why is a passage like this so important? Why is this so vital? Because this passage and passages like it safeguard the gospel through the seriousness of the judgment. In fact, we're charged with being diligent. We are to, as Jude 3 says, contend earnestly for the faith. In Romans 16, 17, Paul writes, Now I urge you, brethren, to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances and turn away from them. Mark them. Keep your eye on them. Teachers of false doctrine, false gospel, they always cause hindrances and dissension. The Bible says they disturb churches, they stir up households. He continues, for such men are slaves, not of the Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. False teachers are not going to waltz into churches and bring a different... No one's going to walk in the door and say, hey, I want to be accepted for membership. They're not going to come up front of you and say, well, I just want you to know ahead of time... Uh, we believe a different gospel, and I plan on bringing this into the church. They're not going to do that. It's not going to come that way. It's going to be more subversive. It's going to be more cunning. It's going to be the side door. It's going to be re-understood, re-imagined. Sometimes people preach false gospel in their ignorance. I think sometimes they're led astray, and they just don't understand exactly what's happening. And frankly, the, what's going on in the, in the landscape right now I don't believe all the ministers who are doing this are doing this vindictively because they're severed from Christ. I think there is an an element of, of dissuasion, of confusion. I think there is deception going on in the minds and hearts of certain people. But the effect is deadly. 
Wolves are always going to sneak in and try to spy out the liberty that we have in Christ to take us captive. They're going to bring a false gospel, a different gospel, a distorted gospel, a contrary gospel, a man-pleasing gospel. But we are to stand firm knowing that a man is not justified by the works. He's going to be justified by his faith in Jesus Christ. Beloved, let me tell you, you don't have to feel pressure from the world or from anywhere else to jump on to whatever culture says about the gospel. They don't know Christ. When the world comes to you and says, you need to be a better Christian. You need to do this. After all, didn't Jesus say? They don't know him. They don't read the Bible. They scan it for their newspaper articles, but they don't know the word. They don't have illumination. They don't have a regenerated heart. They don't know him. You do. They don't understand or believe the gospel. You do. Who else is going to preach this gospel to the world? It's not going to be them. It's going to be you. And that gospel is the same gospel that saved you. It's the same gospel that is sustaining you. That Jesus Christ has given himself on the cross for you to pay for your sins. That he died, buried, was buried, and rose again to bring to you forgiveness, reconciliation, and life. He gives this to all who would repent and believe in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we, we come to you on our faces, humbled by the word. And Lord, I pray that even as we touch on these issues, even as we push back on culture, even as we push back on what's popular, I pray that you would help us not to become haughty and prideful and and manifest a desire to war and to be contentious. I pray that you would save us from that, but rather that we would be godly and discerning and cautious and to evaluate and test everything against the word of God. Not to fly off the handle And scream and shout, but rather to be very wise and to test and to examine. Lord, help us to contend earnestly, not emotionally, but with godliness, patience, sincerity, and holy boldness. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who would contend earnestly for the faith. We can only do this by your grace and mercy. You are our steadfast hope. You give wisdom and understanding. You are the one who enlightens the eyes and has given new blood to the body and new heart that gives life, Lord. You are the one, the author and perfecter of the faith. So we plead with you, God. We entreat you to help us to maintain our adherence to the biblical gospel. Have mercy and help us. In Jesus' name, amen.